how many of you have at least heard of the Broadway hit musical called Hamilton? At least heard of it. Okay, now how many of you have been lucky enough to actually see a show? That, that's because it's really hard to get tickets. Um, I read that over Christmas this past year, uh, tickets were so popular that Broadway set a record. In eight days, they made over $4 million. Average ticket price was $353, and the top ticket prices were over $1,100 for one seat. Now, you know, I I suppose, that the musical tells the slightly reinvented story of Alexander Hamilton, who most of us simply know because his face has been on our $10 bill since 1928. Some of you have him in your pocket right now. But the show and history really revolves around his bitter relationship with a political rival named... Aaron Burr. He looks like a happy fellow. I like to just hang out with him. But did you know, I only know because I lucked on this, but this past Wednesday, July 11th, was the 214th anniversary of one of the most infamous events in American history, and that is the duel that took place between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton that cost Hamilton his life. This is the famous engraving of that moment. Here's the story in a nutshell. Both Burr and Hamilton were highly intelligent, accomplished men of great personal ambition and power. Burr was the sitting vice president at the time under Thomas Jefferson. And uh, Hamilton had been the first secretary of the treasury under George Washington himself. But they were bitter political enemies. Hamilton despised Burr and was very vocal in campaigning against him any chance he had. And Burr, for his part, uh, blamed Hamilton for... um, not being able to win the election to become governor of New York. So he challenged Hamilton to what in those days was called an affair of honor. Duels were not yet outlawed in the United States. Uh, it was a gentlemanly phrase for a, a, a gunfight. Ten paces turned around fired each other. Now, affairs of honor were common in those days. Uh, Hamilton himself had been involved in something like ten of these. But None of them resulted in anybody being shot because typically what would happen is there would be a challenge. They'd get the guns, they'd get all set up, and then when they went to actually fire, the first guy to fire would shoot the gun in the ground, and that was a symbol that we should do this another way so nobody would get shot. But not this time. On July 11th, 1804, the two men and their assistants met at 7 a.m. on the dueling grounds of Weehawken, New Jersey. Ironically, the same exact spot where just three years earlier, Hamilton's son, Philip, who was 19 years old, was killed in a duel defending his own father's honor. Same spot. Now, to this day, there are conflicting accounts about what actually happened because they actually allowed all the witnesses to turn their backs so they had plausible deniability. Okay? So Hamilton's people say Hamilton decided it was wrong, and so he intentionally fired his gun up and over the head of Burr so as not to wound anybody. Burr's people said, no, Hamilton fired at him and just missed. So when Burr fired... He shot Hamilton, mortally wounded him, and he died the next day. Now, the story is tragic, but I think we'd all agree that solving an interpersonal conflict through a duel with guns is really not the wisest thing in the world. In fact, it's extraordinarily foolish. And yet, Burr and Hamilton were both bright and intelligent men. So how does that happen? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're continuing our summer-long series from the book of James called Street Level Faith. We've seen that James... Uh, throughout this letter, is highly concerned with what he sees as a disconnect between what people believe, followers of Jesus, what they believe about the gospel, and how they are living, how they are speaking, what they are doing. Last weekend, we talked about the power of words, how words can be can set on fire, how words can poison. And now today, James teaches us about two kinds of wisdom. So we're in the third chapter of James. I'm going to read this passage to you. And then we'll look to see what we can learn. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. First thing I think James shows us here is the person of wisdom. What does a person of wisdom look like? 
I've shared here many times before that I went to college in the 70s, graduated in 1978 from a small school down in North Carolina called Davidson College. At that time, the town of Davidson was a tiny little southern town, barbershop, 7-Eleven, a couple gas stations, that was about it. But there was also in town this 100-foot-tall, ancient, rickety water tower. I uh, don't, know, don't know when it was built, probably pre-depression, that's what it looked like. And there was a chain-link fence around it saying, warning, danger, no trespassing, which of course meant it was something of a tradition for college students to try to climb the water tower. So I was a senior, one night we're hanging around with a bunch of friends, and we all realized that we were seniors and we had not yet attempted to climb the water tower. So kind of group think took over, and if you can remember college days, it's not unusual. But we decided to head to the tower. Now you need to know that uh, I, my whole life I've never been fond of heights. I just don't like being in places that where I could die. I don't like being on roller coasters, not really. I don't like being on Ferris wheels. I don't like to climb ladders. I will if I have to, but I don't like to. And that was true way back then. So, but I still went with all these, my friends, to the water tower. Everything in me said, this is a bad idea. Do not do this thing. It's 100 feet tall. The ladder is rusty. It's rickety. It's banging against. But I started to climb with everybody else. I got about 50 feet up that ladder, enough to where my heart is pounding, my legs were shaking so badly that the next day I had big bruises on my shins because I was rattling against the, and I had sort of an epiphany, a kind of come to Jesus moment. And I began, I, and I realized there was people, there was like 15 people above me climbing up, there was people below me, I couldn't turn around and go down. If, if even one of those people fell, I was toast, right? So. I began to pray, this sort of foxhole, water tower, ladder type prayer. You know what it's like? If you just get me down from here, I'll never ever do anything stupid again. Well, I ended up getting down. Here's the question. Why would an otherwise intelligent and cautious person do such a foolish thing? Peer pressure? Check. Desire to be liked? Check. Fear of being seen as weak or afraid? Yeah. James says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So what is wisdom? The word James uses here is sophia in the Greek, from which we get our word philosophy. But it means more than intellect, more than knowledge, more than intelligence. It carries the meaning of understanding. A wise person is one who understands how to apply knowledge to life and relationships in a way that brings good results. Hamilton and Burr, both intelligent and knowledgeable men, did not display wisdom. I was a reasonably intelligent college student, maybe a little lazy in the classroom, but reasonably intelligent, but showed a profound lack of wisdom when I joined my friends that night. How do we recognize wisdom? How do we know a person has wisdom? James says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He says we can identify wisdom in two ways. First, good conduct. If Hamilton had said, well, you know what, Mr. Burr, I know we have our differences, but there's a better way to do this, that would have been wisdom. If I would have said to my friends, you know, we all are looking for something fun to do, but that probably is not the wisest thing. I'm going to keep my feet on the ground. I urge you to do the same. That would have been wisdom. Second, James says, in the meekness of wisdom. Now, what's meekness? Meekness is a word in English that we often uh, kind of misunderstand. Uh, we tend to hear it to mean weakness or Timidity, someone who's withdrawn. But that's not what the Greek word means. It meant uh, sort of a gentle strength, a power, but power that was under control. So if we go back to the water tower for a moment, I wasn't showing strength to climb that tower, my friends. I was showing weakness because I was just going along, even when I knew it was not wise. Strength would have been to say, speak wisdom into the situation and try to convince them otherwise. That would have been strength. That's what meekness in wisdom is. So he says that's what a person of wisdom looks like. You see it in their conduct. You see it in their meekness. But where does wisdom come from? It leads us to the second point, which he says is wisdom from below. Wisdom from below. How many of you remember an obscure story of a woman named Wanda Holloway? Okay, leave this image on the screen while I tell the story. Wanda Holloway was a mom of a middle school-aged daughter, 14 years old, 
who in 1991 uh, failed to make her middle school cheerleading squad. And her mother, Wanda, was so desperate to have her daughter make the cheerleading squad in eighth grade that she hired a hitman to kill the mother of a girl on the team, thinking that that trauma would cause the girl to quit the team so her daughter could get the spot. Now, how would you come to think that was a good idea? Right? She was eventually arrested in, uh, for solicitation of murder, sentenced to 15 years in prison. James explains it right here in verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So he's talking about wisdom. And he wants to compare two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom that comes down from above, we'll talk about that in just a moment, and a different kind of wisdom, not from above, but that comes from below. He's talking about a wisdom that's not really wisdom at all. Proverbs chapter 14 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. For example, let's settle our issues by shooting guns at each other. Appears to be right, leads to death. Or, if I can just find a way for my daughter to get on that cheer squad, I know there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. So what does earthly wisdom look like? But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Bitter jealousy is a phrase that comes from two words in the Greek. One means sharp, acrid, or malignant. The other means a, a zealousness, a passion. Put them together and you have a malignant passion to get what belongs to somebody else. Envy. A malignant passion. The phrase selfish ambition comes from one word in the Greek, and it's a word that comes out of the political world, surprisingly enough. It means this seek political office by unfair means, someone who does whatever it takes to get what they want, power. Isn't it interesting that these words were written almost 2,000 years ago in a much different place, different culture, different time, and yet they're just as relevant today in our world. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. That's what drove Hamilton and Burr. That's what drove Wanda Holloway, and sometimes that's what drives us. We want what we don't have. We want what someone else has. Maybe it be status, authority, position, acceptance, wealth. So we have to ask the question, what might have been going on in the early Christian communities that causes James to have to speak to it, to write about this? He's already addressed the issue of partiality, that is treating people differently according to their wealth. He's already dealt with the issue of the tongue, that is destructive words. He's already implied that some should not be teaching who are, that all teachers should be humble. So maybe we can guess that there were some in leadership, some who were teaching, who were doing so out of jealousy and selfish ambition. And James says that jealousy and selfish ambition produces boasting and falsehood. Maybe they were exaggerating their own resumes. Every now and then we hear a story of someone who's fudged a resume to appear to be something they are not, to appear to have training that they do not have or experience they do not have. Maybe that was going on. Maybe they were making uh, claims about themselves that were untrue. Maybe someone was saying, well, I, I walk with Jesus too. I knew him, therefore I need that position. I should have that position. We don't know. Maybe they're teaching a perverted form of the gospel. It was damaging people's faith. So where does this version of, of wisdom come from? What's the source? James uses three words. He says it's earthly. That means it comes from the way the world thinks. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. You've got to take care of yourself. Look out for number one. Get what you can while you can. Wisdom driven by ambition, pride, greed. Proverbs tells us in chapter 9, the fear of the Lord is is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So God, according to the Bible, is the source of all true wisdom. And anything else is earthly. He says, secondly, it's unspiritual. That means it does not come from the Holy Spirit, which is promised, who is promised to every believer. That's God's promise. But wisdom that does not come from the Holy Spirit is 
unspiritual. It comes from our own desires, our own ambitions. It doesn't come from God. And then he says, demonic. Demonic is a word that gets our attention. That's kind of a scary word, but he's not here likely talking about demonic possession, the way we see in horror movies, but rather he's thinking, talking about a thinking, a way of seeing the world, a way of behaving built on lies and falsehood that do not come from God above, that are opposed to God. Paul speaks to this in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on God. And then things can be lost. James then moves on to the results of earthly wisdom. He says, remember, and remember here that his entire theme is that what we believe should show up in what we do, that what we do reflects what we believe. He says, earthly wisdom that is driven by jealousy and ambition and boasting and lies brings two things, disorder and vile practice. Disorder means confusion, instability, vile practice, that which is worthless and evil. It can happen between individuals. Burn Hamilton, for example. It can happen between groups. Think of the political climate in our country today. It can happen between nations. It can happen in marriages. It can happen in families. And it can happen in the church, which is why James is writing the letter. And he goes on to tell us it doesn't have to be that way because there's another kind of wisdom. Not wisdom from below, but thirdly, wisdom from above. Wisdom from above. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness by those who make what does James mean by wisdom from above? Back in chapter 1, he urges readers, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without re- reproach. He's talking about a wisdom that comes from God. Now, it's important to ask the question, how does God impart wisdom? Is it just magical? How does God impart wisdom? I think there are at least four ways. First, God shares his wisdom with us through trials and prayer. Through trials and prayer. Chapter 1 in James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We studied this a few weeks ago. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. James is teaching us, I think, that trials plus prayer produces maturity and wisdom. Let me say that again. Trials plus prayer produces maturity and wisdom. If you think about it, you don't really need wisdom from above when things are going smoothly, during the times when there's smooth sailing, when life is all good. You need wisdom from above when the wheels are falling off. When life is hard and difficult and painful, that's when God promises that if we ask him in prayer, he will grant us his wisdom through the Holy Spirit. So through trials and prayer. Secondly, through the teaching and example of Jesus. It's hard for us to remember that as James is writing this letter, the people he's writing to didn't have the New Testament that we have today. They didn't have the whole thing in front of them. What a great blessing it is for us to have all this. They were hearing from the apostles what Jesus taught, in particular the Sermon on the Mount. And he taught about what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. Jesus himself in chapter 7 of Matthew writes, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, what it looks like to live in God's kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, how to live, how to behave when we're angry, how to treat others, how to see money, all those things. And puts them into practice as like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. We, le- we learn wisdom through Jesus from above. Thirdly, God imparts wisdom through his word. If you read Psalm 119, 
Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What I believe in my heart produces how I live in my life. Continue in verse 35, direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes, not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. And then in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. God imparts his wisdom to his word. Do we take delight in his word? Because it leads us in the way we live. Finally, fourthly, God imparts his wisdom through spiritual leaders, through mature believers, wise, godly counsel who can help us discern God's wisdom. Do you have wise, godly counselors like James in your life when you need to know God's wisdom? Then he goes on to tell us that this wisdom from above looks like eight different descriptives go through these quickly. First he says, this wisdom is pure. The word he uses for pure is the word for holy. It means it's undefiled by selfishness and sin. It's pure, like uncontaminated water. He says it's peaceable. That is not given to conflict. The gospel says we have peace with God. Therefore we can live at peace with others. It's gentle. Again, the word gentle doesn't mean weak. It means secure and strong enough to offer grace even when it's costly to do so. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's exactly what Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Burr needed a couple of hundred years ago. It's full of mercy. It's impartial and sincere. I thought about those words, full of mercy, impartial, and sincere. If you're paying attention to the political world now, you know that there's a vacant spot on the Supreme Court in the United States, and the battle is already being waged over that seat. And it's being waged entirely on the political front. It's it's a political battle. Politics, politics, politics. But I thought, what about impartial and sincere? What about a wisdom that's impartial? Is Is that what we're looking for? It's wisdom from above. And finally, Wisdom from above produces a harvest of righteousness, he says. Wisdom that's from God can be recognized because it produces good fruit. It grows good fruit. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such things Wisdom from above. In 1968, <clears throat> for those of us old enough to remember, I was 12 years old. And if you studied American history, you know that in 1968, it seemed like our country was falling apart at the seams. Okay? The Vietnam War was raging on. There were riots in our inner cities. There were riots on college campuses. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy were killed within two months of each other. Violence and anger were everywhere. I remember watching the TV shows at night, Walter Cronkite. And at the end would be these horrible stories. From all, I remember feeling frightened even as a child. But in that same year, 1968, an unknown, unknown ordained Presbyterian minister who had become disenchanted and frightened about what he saw on television, particularly television programming for children, launched a new vision. He created a different kind of TV show for kids, not filled with commercials and um, violent uh, cartoon images, uh, not just trying to sell kids things like many consumers, but imagine a safe place for children where they would feel special and loved, where their fears would be calmed, where they would be encouraged to think and live wisely in a scary world. It was in 1968, with the wisdom of this world tearing it apart, Fred Rogers launched a revolution in TV programming called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How many remember Mr. Rogers? And you remember that every single show began with him putting on his sweaters. And by the way, his mother knitted every sweater he wore on that show. And he would sing a song. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? Some made fun of him 
what they saw as naive simplicity in a complex world. Some mocked his relentless niceness. But for over 30 years and 895 episodes, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood taught and modeled kindness, patience, understanding, and love in ways that shaped close to two generations of American children. I'd make the argument that what he offered in his way was wisdom from above. Wisdom that was pure, peaceable, gentle, impartial, and sincere. So what are the what are you facing right now in your life? I wonder. What are you facing in your life right now where you need wisdom? Maybe there's a relational conflict somewhere that's painful. You need wisdom. James would say, don't look down. Maybe there's a career decision that's going to impact family. James would say, don't look down, look up. Maybe a financial issue weighing on you. James would say, don't look down, don't look for wisdom from below. There's plenty out there. Look for wisdom from above. If you ask, God in his generation. with me. Lord, once again, thank you for your word. This ancient letter is so full of instruction and wisdom. We do live in a world confused by selfish ambition, jealousy, fear, pride, all those things. And we know these things produce conflict and pain and brokenness. And so by your spirit who lives in us, make us a people of your wisdom. People who are pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy. And through us, may you reap a harvest of good fruit. It's in your name that we pray.